Well, thank you, Richard, um, and uh, Professor Stephen Rock. Uh, first of all, two seconds to congratulate you on an outstanding meeting. Um, obviously, we tend all go to many of these, and this has been outstandingly well organized by your team as well. And Dr. Santori for thinking of inviting me as uh, not only a friend, but a mentor, and I really appreciate your introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to follow to Millis. Um, and that was an amazing talk to remind us about our humanity. And sometimes when I talk about the technology, people quickly go back to saying, well, what about us as humans? And hopefully we'll address that at some point. One thing I want to quote is Dr. Uh, Millis, who quoted Dr. Wagner, the failure to plan is a plan to fail. It's interesting, I was sat there and I listened to that question and I said, well, that's interesting because what I'm about to talk to you about is very different from what we talked about so far. Up until now, and the last lecture was one of the most interesting I've heard in a very long time, was about the care we deliver. What I'm going to speak to you about next is about how we deliver that care. And it's a mind shift. It's also a different paradigm. The paradigm we've just been talking about takes a long time to implement. You have to test it. You have to check it. You have to make sure it's right. You can't operate on people without some certainty. But technology they're going to be referring to next doesn't have those constraints, and it is moving at a logarithmic scale. I cannot take a talk I gave three months ago and give it again. It will be out of date. I spent a lot of time rewriting talks. I spent a fair amount of time going to conferences just to keep up. So let's talk about it, but what I decided to do is to shift the lectures, to go first into a more scientific talk and then back away from something a little more traditional into something that's a little bit bigger picture, the, the big world of digital health. So let's get started with this talk about sensors and predictive analytics. So it's structured like this, and talk a little bit about the expectations we have of sensors, the reality of what sensors can actually deliver today, how we make sense of that data, and I'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence for those computer scientists in the room. Hope you don't mind I dumb it down a little bit. Some of the results of the research I've been doing in this specific space using AI and sensors, and, some of the, and a call to action, if you will, for the work that needs to be done. And if you remember with that 2% rule, what I'm hoping to do is to instill in each of you, especially the researchers in the room and those who have run big labs, the concept that maybe you should start thinking about taking some of these technologies and putting them into your research project as an additional factor, additional variable. So this is an AC72. And I want to get the sound up, please. One of my friends back up there. This is 72 foot long, 13 story tall, seven ton machine. It has a top speed of 55 miles an hour downwind, right? It has over 300 sensors analyzing 30,000 pieces of data per second from the hull daggerboard and every part of that boat, including optical sensors that are on the sails, feeding this information back to the, to the shore where they process it and give real-time data back, the, re the relevant data back to the captain, and overnight before the next race, adjust the boat to optimize it. That was seven years ago. The newer boats are way beyond that. This wouldn't win against a current uh, same class boat. And at the same time, we have an institutional thought about what sensors should be. There should be tricorders. You take a sensor, you point it to somebody, and boom, there's your answer. All your diagnoses in one place. And as we've heard in the last talk, some of the science is a little bit behind what our expectations are. But how far behind are we? There is an exponential growth of sensors. First of all, the number of just wearable sensor shipments are out. But what's interesting is the chart on the left, which is the number of sensors now available. You're talking about accelerometers, heart rate monitors, GPS sensors, gyroscopes, compasses, ambient light sensors, barometers, etc., all available to us. The data from these things is accessible. It comes in multiple shapes and sizes. And it has given rise to what you could call the connected self movement, which is where everybody has information about themselves. And where it's been used now is in sports. Now, Under Armour has three apps. How many of you have one? I have all three on my phone. All right. 250 million other people, obviously nobody here, have it on their phone. 150 million are active. Can you imagine? And I've asked the CEO, can I please access that data? Please, just a little bit of it. 
They're using it to feed back to their, to their, to their customers. They have wristband monitors attached to this thing, heart monitors from the earbuds, they have scales, and this connected shoe, which I have a pair of. What it does as you run, it tells you what your stride length is, and it knows that if a stride length is off, you will be injured, have a high rate of injury, and it feeds that information back to you to decrease your injury rate. Now, there are some sensors we don't think about as sensors. The camera on your phones is a sensor. Because of computer vision, which is the ability of the camera to look at what it's looking at and quantify it and understand it. It's all the technology behind face recognition technology. But in our world of orthopedics, it's been used right now to do things like measure joint range of motion, point a camera to the patient, have them flex back and forth. It is more sensitive than putting sensors directly on the leg and measuring its motion. So yeah, it's the sensor is also a camera. How about the microphone? You probably didn't think of that as a sensor. But the phone can do something crazy. It can do sentiment analysis. When you call the largest phone banks in America, this, the person you're answering has a screen that tells them, the person you're on the phone with is really upset with you. And by the way, these are three things you should tell them to keep them calm. What if we had this available so when your patients are called in, you can tell how much pain they're on? Are they really in pain or simply asking for more medicines? Who knows? But this will tell you that. One more thing. As you think about sensors and technology today, the pictures I showed you earlier, you got to remember, this is fastly moving. Don't think about the sensors as a limiting factor, because they're changing in two fundamental ways. The first is that we're moving away from cloud computing, where the data goes through the phone, over the internet, into the stratosphere, and, or really into servers in Nevada, and then back to your phone with the answer. We're going towards edge computing because the power of the computer is going to be so much so that the computational dynamics can be done in the phone itself, in the device, in your sensor, allowing you real time, very much faster computing and data feedbacks. And the sensors themselves are changing drastically. These are prototypes, but they are essentially the same thing as you have on your wristwatch. And on the far right, what you see is this jacquard, which is a uh, fabric that's been uh, engineered by Google with Levi's to actually be a touch surface throughout the jacket itself. And you can control phones, lights, whatever you're looking for from just simply touching various parts of the jacket. There's other areas that the FDA is slowing us down a little bit because they want to be sure that sensors with implants are not misused, but this is a 10-year-old slide, one of my few old slides. We've had this information for a long time, but what, we could, could, what could we do if we put sensors directly into the devices? Now, once we have all this information and millions and millions of data points, you can't do a spreadsheet to answer this, these questions. You have to get into artificial intelligence. So take me, allow me two minutes to go over this a little bit, just to level set everybody. Artificial intelligence is nothing new about it. We've known about this conceptually since the 1950s, actually the 60s was when it first started to be talked about at Dartmouth. What we didn't have was the computational power, but we actually had the computational power by the late 80s, early 90s. What was still missing was the data, because you need to have both. The data started to come online for everything except in healthcare by the mid-2000s. But it wasn't until very recently that with the digitization of the health record that the data set in healthcare is rising at the fastest pace of any other um, institution of our economy. Meaning that soon enough, not yet, we'll have the kinds of data set that are large enough to make the kind of predictive analytics that you've seen from Google when they figure out what you want before you know it. Now, within artificial intelligence, you have machine learning, and within machine learning, we have deep learning. We are primarily working with machine learning, but let me tell you a little bit about what that is. Because AI, at the end of the day, is something we're all familiar with. It's really regression analysis at scale. It's linear regression at scale. It allows us to take a large data set with patterns that are hidden and find those patterns until you can clearly see what the pattern is so you can make a decision. So it's a way of getting data, creating information from which you can have knowledge. Let's take an example. With machine learning, you must get the data to the computer in a form that it can understand. That usually means converting all your data into a large spreadsheet of numbers consisting of many rows and columns. Each row is called an instance, or an example, the flowers on the left. And each column is called a feature. We would call it a variable, such as color, or in this case, the length of the petal, or the sepal. In other words, somebody has decided what features are relevant, and then it's telling the computer to look for those features 
and in so doing, learn what that looks like so that when it's shown, a new input has never seen, it can say, yes, this is what this is. That is machine learning. But it has limits. Traditional algorithms like this are not useful in working with high dimensional data with lots and lots of variables. And that where there's lots of inputs and outputs and identifying the correct features for the model is very difficult. Identifying the features for the model. What is relevant when you're trying to analyze, uh, say, handwriting? So for this, we have developed something different, and that is deep learning. And deep learning is a class of algorithms that can learn from unstructured data. No spreadsheets. These are networks which are designed to look a lot like a neural network in the brain, and they're capable of learning unsupervised from data that is unstructured and, as I mentioned, unlabeled. It's also known as deep, uh, deep learning, or deep neural networks, and it was kind of coined in 2006. The neural networks look and behave a lot like neurons in the brain. Each collects a piece of information, classifies in a binary or numerical fashion, and passes that information on to the next layer of neurons, which itself processes information before passing it on to the next layer. The information is thus coded, and the output generated has been now been analyzed and classified. What makes a network deep is when these networks are stacked one on top of the other like a pyramid. And this is something that requires tremendous computational power and was not even possible until the past decade. What makes a system powerful is the network changes based on the information that was fed. It literally is software that writes itself to improve itself. It doesn't need our intervention. Phenomenal stuff. And given enough data, and if told precisely what output to maximize for, this type of AI can look at very complex, unstructured data and figure out exactly what features are relevant. So let's see how that works. So this is an example of how a deep neural network works. Here you see a network being fed a data set of raw data. These are photographs. It doesn't know they're photographs. It hasn't been told they're people. It doesn't know how they have eyes and noses, but it figures out quickly that it finds patterns, and these patterns are from variations in contrast, and it represents them to show faces. The software is not told to do this. It just figured it out. So how do we use it? Oh, my phone. Yeah. Well, somewhere. Yeah, here. OK. Thank you. So how do we use it? This is an example of how we use AI to look at um, trying to figure out if we could show the, uh, a neural network an X-ray of, of an aseptically loose hip, or a loose hip, you know, septically aseptic, just a loose hip, and see whether or not it could figure it out. And we, showed a we used 754 patients. We knew what the answer was from, we used surgical findings as the, as the ground truth. Then we applied multiple computational networks, and it was able to figure out with an accuracy of 80%, sensitivity of 70%, specificity of 95%, whether or not the implant was loose. And this is work done by using a network that we borrowed off the internet that was made free of, freely available by Google in our lab in a matter of days. So it's kind of cool stuff. It's super powerful. Imagine you can do it with a little more funding. <clears throat> The variation in thickness of cartilage is important to some of us who, who are interested in kinematic knee alignment. But we want to know exactly how thick the cartilage truly is. It's, a, it's a, sort of a point of contention in that space. The biggest study to date had looked at a couple hundred MRIs. We were able to look at nearly 4,000 MRIs with great accuracy to figure out the exact thickness of cartilage at two data points. Looked at, found some variation between females and males, some variances from distal to posterior, medial to lateral. But the key thing I want to show you here is that to look at 4,000 MRIs, it took us two days of a moderately fast computer. <laughs> two things to remember about AI. Data bias. If we, looked, if we gave us a neural network every cl newspaper clipping about this coronavirus, it would assume that only Chinese people get coronavirus. Give it 12 more months, maybe 24 months, when everybody's had coronavirus, that association doesn't come up anymore because it's got a fuller data set. This other slide says the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool closely match Nicolas Cage's appearances in movies. Those are associations, true, true, not related, but AI will do that. It will find patterns, but it's not causational. It's something we have to keep in mind as we look at this data and how it's implied. So how, uh, if you're interested in this topic, I wrote a, a piece on the Journal of Arthroplasty you might find 
interesting to go back and just clarify things. So we're moving to an era of precision medicine, and some of the genetics work that, we've been able to sh that we just were shown is only part of it. We'll have radiographic parameters, clinical parameters, a bunch of data will be made available to us to make sense from, and the patients will eventually require a wish for us to give them the exact precise treatment that is appropriate for their gene, gene type, their medical history, where they're coming from, and how do we do that? The big part that, we, that I want to focus on is the digital parameter piece. This is the science part. So we have all this patient-generated health data. That is the modern terminology for this. We have wearable sensors, which are very inconsistent. They're not validated, and they only have internal reference points. The question we wanted to answer, what are the true digital parameters? What is the holy grail? I mean, we don't actually know. How much data do we need to collect for predictive analytics? How frequently? What time frame? How accurate does it actually have to be? When we, can we predict patient report outcome measure using patient generated health data? And will patients actually collect this information for us to work with? These are questions that to date are still unanswered. And we've got to answer them before we can actually move forward in a more clinical fashion. So we did a little pilot research project. It was small, but we were looking for signals. We gave three sensors to 22 patients, followed them from four weeks before surgery to six weeks after, got patient reported outcomes scored, pulled the entire health record, used national language processing to do data extraction. We identified 33 features per patient. We then put those into a machine learning algorithm, had well over 3 million data points. And the analysis was super cool, primarily using k-means testing, which is not particularly fancy AI. And we found a few things. First of all, one of our residents, Ilya Bendish, published the first paper looking at what we could tell. And what was learned was when we looked at the change in average daily step count, we could, uh, we could predict the VR12 PCS score with a reasonable R squared value. And when we're looking at who's who's, though, we had to look at average daily minutes active. Now, the key point here is that when we looked at the data, absolute values were of no use. The exact step count at a specific point wasn't that variable, valuable to try to predict how that patient was doing. It was trends over time that were valuable. And one set of data did not necessarily predict both types of outcomes. Now, that's important. I'll come back to it. This is what step count looked like, kind of cool stuff. It shows you all, everybody in the far left. You see one patient in the far left, the, the, the vertical line, of course, the date of surgery, and you see that that patient didn't do very well. Well, it turns out he had a periprosthetic fracture put on crutches. The other patient did very well. The point here is that you can track patients remotely and figure out who's doing well and not doing well without necessarily seeing them. This is something that allows us to do long-term tracking. The core paper was this one, though. I want to know whether I could predict PROMs. Because PROMs is something that I use to calculate, in to some extent, reimbursement. And they're not particularly accurate. And is there a way for us to use objective data to, at the very least, predict how people are doing? And so we, we, this is where we applied the, the, the more complicated machine learning algorithms. And what we found, again, was that it was very interesting that there were subsets of data sets, the quantitative data, like step count, that predicted things like the VR12. But if you want to predict who's and who's, we well, used to do qualitative data, which was pelvic tilt, pelvic motion in space. The quality of the gait was more predictive of who's and who's. We also found that all the EHR data was of no use to us. And interestingly enough, the minute, by minute data, although it was superior to average data, wasn't that critical. Why does that matter? Because if you're trying to collect data and, the, and having second-by-second second data, because that sounds like a better idea, and you, what you find is that the trend in those values is more, va more important than the value itself. And so it helps us to rethink how we do our studies in the future about the quality of that information isn't so critical. So you don't have to spend a Oh, to buy a very expensive sensor, as long as that device is internally consistent, you will get the patterns that you need to do predictive analytics. So here we go. Cadence, for example, not so great for CUS, but was pretty good for VR12. Cadence being more of a qualitative measure gate. And what I really like about machine learning is when you, when you, when you, when you put the output out, it, it, it does this clustering business. And to me, clustering like this is a heck of a lot easier to follow than HR scores or, or risk assessments. Because I can tell you, the blue patient is doing well, the yellow patient maybe not so much, and the red patient should come in to see me. Wouldn't it be nice if that was a constant device that you can just simply pull in the patients who need to be seen, and the others you can follow remotely? 
other information we found was that wearable activity sensors and early pain after joint arthroplasty were not related. In other words, the patients who there was a fair amount of difference in the amount of activity after surgery. We kind of assume patients all have the same fall pattern after surgery. It's wildly different in terms of what they actually do once they get home. But the patients who moved the least had the least pain and had equivalent scores. So maybe an argument for less physical therapy early on. So in conclusion, the use of sensors is still in its infancy, but the potential is not to be underestimated. I encourage those of you to consider including sensors in your research. We still need to quantify and understand the basics in this patient population, and need to get up、uh, longitudinal data to better understand how they're doing and avoid unnecessary care. Our goal is this: it's a simple dashboard, synthesizing an immense amount of data into actionable values. Most cars have 30 sensors and approximately five microprocessors in them, but this is all you see. We need to get to this stage. We can't handle millions of data points, right? We need to get to this point. So, with that, I want to finish this talk and thank you very much for your attention. And I got through that one. <laughs>